In 1651, Nostradamus predicted, One day the Lily brothers will grow up and one will settle in the great Rome. The mountains will shake and the road to the Romans will open, and the Pasha will attack the Ottoman stronghold. Single quote single quote. According to tradition, this is a prophecy referring to Kosem. The white lily is intended to refer to the coronation turban and its shape. To understand this prediction, it is necessary to remember that the Ottoman dynasty, like all Byzantine dynasties, called itself, Romans. Leaves the name Constantini. Whether we want to believe it or not, Nostradamus was wrong by a year. However, one cannot ignore the fact that Kosem started the fall of the empire. He told as well, the young lion will overcome the older one. In a field of combat in single fight, he will pierce his eyes in their golden cage. Two wounds in one, then he dies a cruel death. Mustafa Han is definitely a character that deserves his own movie. This is a story in which we can see all the facets of human nature. A figure that has been hypocritical for centuries. Boran Kuzum played the role of Sultan perfectly. He conveyed the feelings of this character like Jochen Phoenix in the role of Commodus. Both of these historical figures had too many influential opponents for us to have a chance to see their true colors, and one could even say that they were born in the wrong times, families and places. Their stories are false. Chronicles are written by the victors. The story of Mustafa is especially like that, because we became more interested in this man only thanks to the series. The history of Commodus began to be discovered earlier, but lies about this man continue to be repeated. To learn about the tragedy of Mustafa Khan, we must first outline the era a bit. The biggest problem with Mustafa Khan is that we don't really know anything about him. Most of the sources that mention him come from Kosem, and these are propaganda sources with one goal, to blameless the Sultana. Only recently we have begun to look into the Habsburg and Moldavian archives, which reveal a completely different man. It is from these archives that we know, for example, that he had Cadence. Kosem wanted to discredit his brother-in-law as much as possible. We cannot rule out the possibility that with age he became a man of madness, but he was certainly not so in his first reign. His madness is contradicted by one small detail that was forgotten in the series, Magnificent Century Kosem, which deviates greatly from history and blameless the character of Vili de Sultan, which viewers and Turkish historians began to accuse the series of. Kosem gave the order to kill his daughter. Such a thing was never done in the harem, because the daughters had no influence on the government and were a great tool for forming coalitions. The law of Constantinople, which Kosem herself officially abolished, applied only to men. There was no reason to stroke the girl, unless she could be proof that her father was not mad at all. The history of Mustafa Khan is closely connected with Kosem, a sultana who, after the death of her partner, forged his will and announced a new system called Kafish. She didn't actually invent it, but was inspired by the story of Timur Lenk and Bayezid Yildirim. From then on, the princes were to be kept in isolation, in complete confinement, until the previous ruler died in order to ascend the throne. It was not entirely complete isolation, because in this wing of the palace there were all the ruler's male relatives who were not his sons, as well as serving women called Gedekli, who helped with bathing, because princes, after all, could not bathe themselves. Men couldn't do it either. And contrary to various theories created especially by European authors, it was not about anything other than protection against homosexual tendencies, which could naturally arise in such a situation. Sterilized women also stayed with older men. Initially, they used contraception, but because it didn't work, it was changed. Kafish are a controversial place. The only original fragment of top copy that has survived to this day, but we cannot visit it because you need a permit to do so. I truly agree with most historians. Cafes was more harmful than the law of Constantinople, when only one heir could remain. This was not Turkish law, because the Byzantines had already done so. At best, the throne was taken by someone who had spent 20 years in prison, i.e., a person completely unadapted to the realities of the world at that time. It's like someone waking up from a coma after so many years. This is acceptable for an ordinary mortal, but not for the ruler of an empire who, with this awakening, will have millions of lives to rule.
At the end of the empire, the ruler will change every few months, because the army will learn that by taking someone out of the Kafish, they will get more privileges, and maybe another war, and thus become richer. We owe this deprivation to the army, to none other than Kosem, who, as soon as one of her sons grew up and started to think for himself, used bribes to incite prisoner rebellions in order to elect a new sultan, of course the younger the better. Just to remain regent and have access to treasury. She set her sons on each other. She ruined the country. After her death, a pair of earrings was worth $25 million in today's currency, an amount unimaginable at the time. One pair of earrings plugged the budget hole. Her pearls, which were worth much more, were lost. It is believed that they came from Barbara Radzawil's veil. Kosem is still one of the richest people in history, but her fortune was created mainly thanks to bribes and stealing from the state. She developed bribery like no other in history. When she ran out of sons, she decided to put her grandson on the throne, but his mother was her ward and knew Kosem perfectly, as well as her methods, and what's worse, the court began to think on its own. By law, Prince Turhan's mother should become Vili Day and Kosem should step aside. However, this did not happen, and two manners quickly appeared. Everything that Turhan approved, Kosem revoked. It was a repeat of Mustafa Han's second reign, but this time Kosem does it openly. Finally, she decided to kill her grandson to replace him with another grandchild, an infant. This was the last straw, because everyone knew that Kosem would take over the entire power, and what's worse, she ordered her to be addressed as, Padisha, which was a title only given to men. The ruler of the empire. Let us recall that since the reign of Mehmed Fadi, the word sultan has referred to women rather than men, and over time it will only refer to women. This often confuses Europeans, because the ruler of the Ottoman Empire is still called, Sultan, in many languages. Kosem was never married to Ahmed. Such information began to appear after the broadcast of the series, which falsified history. There are no such documents in the Turkish archives, and wedding treatises would certainly have been preserved. She started calling herself Kosem in her letters to European rulers, about which it seemed that she had a slight complex, although everyone knew perfectly well how the Porta system worked and this emphasis on being a wife surprised the courts. Kosem assumed that since rulers there are always born from formal relationships, I should also be in one, at least on paper, only to increase my prestige and position. The Spanish court smiled to itself. In fact, only one letter mentions it. Ahmed's attitude to life also contradicts this marriage. Ahmed had many women whom Kosem brutally eliminated. This proves that he did not marry any woman according to the Yasa law that was in force in the country, and there was probably not even a Haseki in the harem. It would also explain Kosem's subsequent maniacal desire to emphasize how important she was to Ahmed. The only marriage documents we have are the wedding certificate of Haram and Suleiman. Osman will definitely get married. Exactly. That's why the series is called Bashkaden. Kosem was just Bashkaden, the most important of the Kadans. Literally the head of the Kadans. Just before his death, Ahmed left a letter in which he begged that no one would entrust Kosem to power in the future, because it would destroy the country. Unfortunately, Kosem was faster. Ahmed grew up with Anastasia, who later took the name Hatije, then Mapiker, and after her death became officially Kosem. Hatije is the name she received after entering the harem gates. Mapiker was the name that best reflected her personality. It was given to him by Ahmed after the birth of their first son. It means, the other side of the full moon. This is the name of Lilith in the Middle East, and indeed Lilith was destined to reduce a vast empire to dust. Kosem is the name given to Vili Day by the people. The name has an O with dots. It doesn't read like the German umlaut when you sometimes try to create O from these letters. It's more gutturally pronounced O. It was nothing other than sarcasm, as it refers to a she-wolf. In Turkish, this word means alpha she-wolf. In Persian, the beginning of the word kus means shark. However, this she-wolf did not behave like a she-wolf at all. The name She-Wolf was used to describe women in Western and Eastern Europe who had been at the helm of government since late antiquity. The term, of course, referred to the Roman Capitolona and her two sons. 
In a sense, it was praise, because women rose above men, which was practically impossible at that time, especially in Western Europe. However, what these women had in common was that they stood united and fought to protect their children. Only the throne provided this protection. A she-wolf is famous for taking care of her offspring, but this she-wolf was doing something completely different. To humans, Kosem's behavior was incomprehensible. So far, women in the harem fought among themselves, causing the death of their rival's sons, because they knew that their sons would only survive if they ascended the throne. Otherwise, the Shavush will come and eliminate the male descendants. This is how the country has functioned for centuries. The reason was the country's system based on a mercenary army that proclaimed a ruler. It seems that the sultan was an absolute ruler, like the basilis, but this is not true. In fact, both of them were hostages of a mercenary army, and, over time, of courtiers who only cared about their own interests. The absolutes were the rulers of France, Prussia and Russia in that era, but, contrary to myths, not sultans, although it was from this belief that European absolutism was born. On the day of the coronation, the general asked directly if there were any other claimants to the throne. The ruler replied, no. The general, prove it. Then you could hear the famous, take out the coffins. The gates to the harem opened and the bodies of all the male descendants of the predecessor, as well as his pregnant women, were taken out. It seems it's cruel from today's perspective, but it was a greater good. Besides, like most historians with a good reputation, I believe that history should not be looked at from the perspective of our mentality. We can do it up to 80 years ago. It's about generational and historical differences. Only a good expert on the subject with historical knowledge may be tempted to comment on the feelings of people from the past, not a person who has textbook knowledge, or even worse, the internet. In a few dozen years, our behavior may also be incomprehensible to a person living in a given era. Had rebelled, there would have been a huge chaos in the country. At that time, one of the two best armies in the world, it would have destroyed at least most of the country, because it is an extraordinary killing machine. It was created only for this purpose and was incapable of doing anything else. It was better to remove someone from the family than to condemn the nation to the apocalypse. And the Yenissary have been able to rebel for any reason since the death of Selim Sarai. In fact, they started showing their horns already during the reign of Suleiman, but he was able to feed them and fulfill their wishes. There are fewer and fewer wars because the country was expanding to its maximum potential. These people are causing confusion because they simply have no job and can only live by killing. Kafish produced mostly crazy people. Hardly any sultan will be normal after leaving this place. Even though they had sterilized courtesans and Gedekli in this strange place, they could not go outside, and what was worse, they lived in fear. They also did not have proper education, although there were books, but what if someone did not have time to learn to read with their mother? Let's not forget about this when they get there. After the death of his father or brother. They can be 20 years old, but they can also be a year old, although on the beginning the babies were moved with their mothers to Eski Sarai, but it was only the goodwill of Vaili Day or Haseki. Kosem rarely shows it. Yes, they lived in luxury and most of their whims were fulfilled, but the very fact that food was served through a crack in the door reminded them that they were prisoners. It is a place of luxury, but also a cruel prison, because Kosem has already shown that she does not intend to protect all the princes. You were constantly under pressure that they would kill you. It is amazing that despite the fact that Mehmed Fadi conquered the empire thanks to Byzantium's weakness, i.e. the Viking mercenary army, but unfortunately for his descendants he took over the entire political system. Thus he made a huge mistake. If Fatih had learned from other people's mistakes, the Ottoman Empire would certainly have lasted. Ahmed was not a normal person, and his offspring born to Kosem also show all sorts of mental disorders. He and Kosem grow up together. Ahmed's favorite game is drowning the servants. Drowning in the literal sense of the word. Kosem accompanies him in this. They are over a dozen years old. Unfortunately, Sultan Mother Handan does nothing about it. The series has aged the ruler greatly. On the day of his coronation, he was not even circumcised. Such upbringing must have taken its toll. This man's only normal son was actually Osman. However, the whole story began during the reign of Suleiman and Selim Sarai. Murad Han marries Safiye, 
probably a relative of his mother Nirbanu, but from legal relationship. Another version talks about an Albanian woman. Nirbanu hates her daughter-in-law and it seems that this hatred could have been caused by kinship, so the first version is more probable. Nirbanu did not allow Mehmed to come to power much, unless it was a matter of warfare. After her husband's death, she completely removed the burden of power from him. A very good Pan Sanjak turns into a not-so-good Padisha. How to keep your son away from politics? By giving him women and inflating his sexuality so that he only thinks about it. Murad III is a sex addict. He has many women, and the production of children is so high that newborns are often killed while the sultan is still alive. After Nirbanu's death, in order for the sultan to sign a decree, Safiye will have to threaten him with leaving his bed and that is the only thing that will work. He is the first sultan in history to do so and certainly contributed to the false myth that these rulers spent their lives only in the harem. His son Mehmed was involved with two women. Mehmed III's favorite is Haile May, whom he wants to marry, but Safiye does not want this. Haile May is a woman who knows what she wants and thinks for herself. Safiye will learn that it was a huge mistake to do everything to remove this woman from her son's life and path to the throne. She chooses Helena Komnenos, from the Basilis family aka Handan, as her ally. She is most closely related to the family of the former rulers of the state. Contrary to post-war propaganda, the Greeks were not at all bothered by marrying off the daughters of their illustrious families to sultans. In this way, they further influenced politics. Handan's son is Ahmed. Haile May's sons are Mahmud and Mustafa, as well as daughter Sa, known as Gilruba in the series, and Hatije Sultan. Mahmud was sentenced to death because he allegedly incited rebellion against the ruler. The father was supposed to receive information about it anonymously. Supposedly, in the apartments of the prince and his mother there was a prophecy that he would take over the throne. It wouldn't be strange for him to take over the throne because he was the oldest. Why such a rumor? The main thing was that it was an omen and the court was more superstitious than anyone else. The whole thing was certainly carefully planned by Safiye, perhaps together with Handan. This is the beginning of the end. A woman who grew up with the famous Suleiman the Magnificent during the Golden Age of the Empire. A woman who was included in the list of the most powerful rulers of rulers. The woman who to this day is on the list of the richest people in history, right after Kosem, suddenly loses her political sense. There is one answer. She doesn't want to lose power so much that she will remove those capable of power to the mediocrity just to stay in power. The prophecy was a sufficient argument for the temperamental Mehmed III. What's worse, the Shavash carried out the order in front of the children, which was a precedent in history, because the ruler ordered education. Ahmed and Mustafa had to live in fear from the very beginning. The English envoy to the court notes that Mehmed was greatly influenced by his mother, and therefore was hated at the court, and, like Contarini, he believes that the sole reason for the prince's death was the father's jealousy of the son's greater competence than him. Mahmud was indeed considered a good commander and had the support of the Yenissary, and in fact he has the support of the Yenissary and the entire country. By the harem war. He was certainly too healthy and too young to die naturally. His heart attack during his sleep is very mysterious, in fact, by this statement alone, we can guess that it was not a natural death. Dying while sleeping in Topkapi is like slipping on the stairs in ancient Rome, and the most intriguing is a heart attack. He may have inherited the disease from Selim I. It is no secret that he considered himself a god when he tried to poison his last living son. Hafsa decided to invite him to the last dinner of her life. His daughter Hatij was a manic depressive woman who eventually committed suicide. We will not ordain Ibrahim Pasha because let's remember something that was not shown in the series to whitewash him, and that was the cause of his death. Not only did he refer to himself in letters to the rulers of foreign countries as Sultan, which he is not, or the second most important person after the Sultan, which he is not, because there is no such person in this system, but he has yet taken a second wife, and princess spouses are bound by monogamy, just like women in a harem. Why? To prevent bastards from entering the dynasty. Hatij would endure the entire harem and beatings by her husband, but for the dynasty it was an embarrassment, especially in the arena of Eastern politics. Ibrahim forgot himself. 
I do not mention that he did not provide the ruler with many important data. Safiye remembers Suleiman the Magnificent and his history perfectly. Perhaps she noticed something that indicated that it was better to remove her son from the political arena for the good of everyone. Contrary to the content of the series and the internet. Today it is believed that Mustafa was older than Ahmed, so he had priority to the throne. Some believes that he has 33 years old that day. So why didn't he sit on it? In the first texts about Mustafa, the only word we find to describe him, let's say his otherness, is something that can be translated, lame person. It seems that the boy had some weakness in one of his arms, which can be seen in his portraits. Nowadays it's not a problem, but not in those times, not with this army and not with this mentality. In a dynasty, people are born with defects of this type. Prince Jahangir had scoliosis. Some say he was an incomplete chimera and the hump was a partially absorbed fetus. In some source texts we read about arm paresis. We won't find out. The Ottomans like Bonaparte family are very reluctant when it comes to the issue of genetic testing in the family. When Mehmed suddenly died, only small children remained. Safiye is afraid of losing influence at court. She developed a taste for power. She corresponds with Elizabeth Tudor, Ivan the Terrible, the Jagiellonians, Catherine de' Medici. It is believed that Henry III de Valois stayed briefly at the court of Haseki Safiye, Vili de Nurbanu. She has a huge dilemma at the moment. She is an educated woman. She knows history, but he also knows people's mentality. She is afraid that the army will not accept the crippled ruler. There are reasons for this. Justinian II was mutilated and returned to the throne, but he no longer resembled a lion and was brutally overthrown. Safiye certainly knows the story of the Prince de la Verici, Petrus Gonsalves, who, according to Nostradamus' prophecy, was the only son to survive and extend the de Valois dynasty, although he was not of the dynasty. However, she knows that this is not possible in her world. But Saifi could have been wrong. After all, Baudayan le Lepro is worshipped by Jews, Muslims and Byzantines because, together with Salah ad-Din, they established on the lands of Palestine and Israel the longest peace in the history of this region. That's ten years. Basilus wanted to marry his daughter to him. The Byzantine court knew that leprosy was a disease that was very difficult to contract. This is not divine punishment, as is believed in the West. Not every leprosy is leprosy in fact, as is unfortunately believed in the West, thus dooming people to later infection. Not everyone will have symptoms of infection. Not everyone will get infected. Western Europe will not understand this for a long time, and Altmer will disappear because of this faith. You don't help such a ruler even if he is the wisest of all of us. Perhaps there is something else Safiye was afraid of. As mentioned in later sources, the series was keen to highlight the age difference between the brothers. Certain threads would not be acceptable due to age in our century. However, this difference was only a few months. Back then, it might have been difficult for someone with this condition to rule such a troublesome country. She chooses Handan. Haile May doesn't seem to know how to play this game of chess very well, and is often thought to have left the stage altogether. Some say she may have been sick at the time. Safiye does not know that in a few years Kosem will force Handan to commit suicide and will overthrow her. Indeed, it was Kosem's too quick access to such enormous power that harmed her the most. She felt like a god. Handan is young and inexperienced. Mustafa initially stays with his mother. We can even say that they initially remain in the Saray, because both Ahmed and Mustafa become victims of the measles that were prevalent at that time. Some sources talk about rubella. Ahmed is so sick that he issues a decree. Mustafa can take the throne in the event of his death. Some say Safiye even placed him on the throne for a few hours. However, there is no proof of this. Ahmed is so young that Safiye wants to leave two grandchildren alive. Despite this, she is afraid of how people will approach how people will approach this plan and spreads false rumors that the ruler is older. Unfortunately, the series also followed this path and maintained the court's propaganda, which was considered true for over half a year. Initially, it was said that the sultan was 18 years old, and in a few months a rumor spread that he had already fathered heirs. This rumor will be around for quite some time. In fact, Ahmed is not even circumcised. 
his circumcision will not go through as it should. An infection will occur and the sultan will have to undergo another surgery to extend the family tree. His father was obscenely fat. He even couldn't move. Ahmed will also be like a fattened pig in a few years. Haile May's problems only begin when Safi is sent back to the old palace. Did she really send one of her sons to France on the day of Mehmed III's coronation and he became the famous Yahya de Montenegro? Thirty-eight coffins were carried out that day. The most in history. It was the bloodiest coronation and Safiye herself, looking at the spectacle, muttered under her breath that it was time to change it. It's possible that Yahya was her son, and even if he wasn't, it was legally because she was a Vaili Day and Haseki was. The children of all mothers lower in the hierarchy were also obliged to recognize Haseki, who is the most important woman in the harem, as their mother. This is a legacy from ancient Egypt. The Osmans family are very reluctant to undergo any genetic tests, just like the Bonapartes, so it is doubtful that we will find out the truth, although we have such a possibility, because we have the bodies of all the actors. According to some legends, it was Kosem herself who asked Mustafa to stay alive. This is rather unlikely, considering her subsequent behavior. Mustafa simply had to live, because Ahmed was sickly and initially had difficulty fathering descendants. Interestingly, Envoy Contarini met Prince Mustafa once when he was with the delegation to Handan, that was, at the time when the boy was taken away from his mother, who had to move to Eski Sarai. At that time, the prince stayed in the palace with Vailide Handan, who was also legally his mother. He doesn't write anything about the prince's madness, but on the contrary he says, he's a good boy. It's a pity that he will soon put his head under axe. A comforting and terrifying statement. The fact is that Ahmed brought back from Eski Sarai Mustafa when he thought he was dying. Was Ahmed a syphilitic, as Knowles claims, and hence his problems with fathering offspring, which would also explain Kosem's behavior? We will never know, but Kosem certainly would not have lived to this age if she had been a syphilitic. Women entering the harem were also examined from this angle. This is unlikely. The same author believes that the Sultan did not kill his brother because he had a vision the night before the planned assassination. Some tests also reveal the rather mystical figure of Mustafa. After the prince lived in solitude, he was visited by his brother, who came with expensive gifts and even gave him women. The prince thanked him for the gift, saying only that all he wanted was a home and food. Perhaps it was just a trick the same as Claudius's. Mustafa read a lot about the ancient Romans. His situation was similar. It was better to play stupid to survive. Perhaps he really wasn't interested in power. The fact is that for some time the prince had been given opium in his food, and as a result he was slowly sentenced to death and turned into a madman. His visions could have been related to the fact that he was on high, and not only because it was fashionable at the court at that time. It is not known whether because of his illness, or more likely, they wanted to treat him as the Mughals did, who, unlike the Ottomans, eliminated rivals to the throne using this method. It is not entirely true that Ahmed did not want Mustafa dead. He probably couldn't do that right now. This did not prevent him from ordering the Shavushas twice to kill his brother. He certainly had no great affection for Mustafa, and perhaps Handan or Safiye held him back from this decision, but certainly not Kosem. She drowns the servants with him. Most at that time believe that Mustafa pretends to survive. Due to the entire situation and surroundings, Mustafa was under constant pressure. We are talking about a teenage boy who knows that every day will be his last. There is something else worth mentioning. Ahmed had absolutely no interest in politics. Handan took power, and then Kosem. Initially, Handan and Safiye themselves pushed him away from politics in order to stay in power. How to do this? Make the boy fall in love with the harem and hunting, and allow him to indulge in all manner of luxuries. Over time, this backfire on the state, and excessive freedom would cast a shadow over subsequent generations. Hafsa never had the idea of letting her children drown servants for fun. Yes, Ahmed founded the huge Ahmed Kami Mosque known as the Blue Mosque and, unlike other mosques, it is only a symbol of his megalomania. This could have put him at odds with his grandmother, because she rightly asked her grandson what he had done to spend so much money on temples. That's the problem, nothing. Ahmed Kami is a symbol of the pride of Kosem and Ahmed. 
So far, mosques were built by rulers after winning wars or in gratitude for saving the country from natural disasters. Money wasn't wasted like that. Ahmed did not have the same military achievements as his predecessors, and there are no disasters on a larger scale. They will only appear during the reign of his partner. Safiye reminds his grandson that this is an unnecessary expense that only depletes the state budget. This must not please the young man who has heard so far and thought he was allowed to do anything. According to some theories, Safiye died alone in Eski Sarai, according to others, she was strangled there. Kosem's first child is Fatma and the second is Aisha, but there are also Selim, Orhan, Ibrahim, Kazim, Selim, Suleiman, Mehmed Hanzade and Gaber Khan. We won't see many of them in the series, although Selim's death on Murad's orders made a lot of noise. The list of Ahmed's children is long and many of them were not sired by Kosem, although she claimed to be their mother. We have a son born from Gulbahar Bayezid, as well as other children, Osman, Hussein, Hassan, Solem, Abide, Atik, Zahid, Esma, Zainuk, Esma, Hatije. These children were born year after year, which confirms the fact that Kosem could say that she was the ruler's wife and his favorite, but these are just stories. The harem is full of women. Kosem became a mother only ten years after Ahmed became ruler, so she was not initially as powerful as she claimed. Madame de Gomez claims that over time Kosem ordered the murder of pregnant Cadence. She did this for the first time when she found out that the Sultan was in a relationship with his sister's maid and had marriage plans for her. He orders her to be brought to her, undressed, and then strangled, which enraged Ahmed. He attacked Kosem, beat her and severely injured her. This took place during the wedding of his sister and daughters. After many years, she will cook Gulbahar in a bathhouse. It is no proof of marriage that Murad IV writes in a letter to the Venetians that Kosem married Ahmed. He could have not written this letter, because in that time she is a regent or he could have confirmed a lie that was beginning to turn into the truth. It may also have been more convenient for him to confirm his mother's status as a suitable queen. Over time, Kosem's ambitions begin to terrify Handan herself, who suggests other women to her son, just to keep him away from the one who has strange preferences, what were these preferences? Maybe Kosem encouraged Ahmed to drown service and cruel feats. However, Handan makes a mistake. Establishes a new office of commander-in-chief of the Sultan's guard. This is Bairam Aga, who quickly wins the Sultana's heart. Interestingly, Kosem is a gift from him. It doesn't matter whether an affair actually took place or whether there were rumors of too much intimacy. The fact is that these two knew each other before Helena entered the harem gates. Handan has no choice. Kosem blackmails her and gives her a choice. Either she will commit suicide or Kosem will reveal the affair. Vaili Day Sultan does not cover her face, takes part in political meetings, has enormous power, has her own property, corresponds with foreign rulers, and influences political decisions. Women in Europe will be waiting for something like this for a long time, even if they are queens. Vaili Day Sultan can do almost anything, but she can't get relationship with anyone. In the era of lack of genetic tests, this would undermine the ruler's rights to the throne. It is not certain whether the affair lasted longer and the lover was the father of the ruler, not the previous ruler. The penalty for this is beheading. Handan has no choice. Another version of events says that Ahmed himself ordered his mother to be poisoned because he wanted to finally be an independent ruler. It's not impossible. Either way, Handan became uncomfortable. The fact is that Ahmed is the first sultan in history not to care about mourning for his mother. So there were no great feelings there, but Ahmed was devoid of feelings. The lame boy stays with his mother, but then he is suddenly taken away from her and locked in solitude. It is possible that the boy fell into psychosis. The fact that he talked to himself as a child is not an argument that he was mentally ill. The more obvious argument is the drowning of the servants. Young children often talk to imaginary friends while playing. This already takes place during the mysterious disappearance of Safiye. The fact is that Safiye disappears right after Yahya's invasion of Constantinople. The lockdown certainly affected the boy, but we can't trust the Kosam Chronicles too much. In 1612, several weddings take place, including the wedding of Sa Sultan, 
presented in the series as Dilruba, and of eight-year-old Gevherhan. This second wedding is a precedent, because the girl was too young to get married even for people governed solely by Quranic law. She will have twenty more husbands. The girl was quickly divorced from Kara Mehmed Pasha because the political alliance did not work. That's when Ahmed injured Kosem. It seems he begins to notice that the greatest enemy is next to him. Aisha got married at the age of seven and later became a widow. Kosem will abuse her daughters like this until her death. Poor Gevherhan will eventually commit suicide. It is not known whether Haile May was allowed to take part in the celebrations. The prince was certainly not allowed, although according to some legends he was. At the opening of Ahmed Kami was certainly there and from certain texts it can be concluded that Ahmed wanted Mustafa on the throne at that time. At that time, there was an assassination attempt on the sultan. Ahmed begins to show symptoms of illness. His children are small, and Kosem is increasingly turning into a degenerate monster obsessed with power. At that time, the ambassadors mentioned that the sultan would prefer to see his brother on the throne, if only for the safety of his own children. Maybe it was not Kosem who supported Haile May, but Ahmed himself for Mafaruz. Ahmed will die in five years. He is 27 years old. It is commonly believed that the cause of death was a ruptured ulcer or stomach cancer. Ahmed is the first sultan who had no administrative experience, and Mustafa II, thanks to Kosem and Handan, which locked him in isolation for years. Kosem is forced to go to Eski Sarai. It is not entirely certain what is happening at that time, but it seems that due to the abundance of pretenders to the throne, the Yenissari simply do not know who to choose. They do not want children on the throne, because it means the power of the woman, and that is what they said goodbye to. Perhaps Kosem, like Haile May, realizes this. Mustafa's elevation to the throne is beneficial to Kosem. She and Mafaruz hated each other from the beginning. After Ahmed's death, Kosem forms an alliance with Haile May. Her children are small. Osman too should ascend the throne, but the boy is a traditionalist. He knows that Yenisari should be liquidated because they are destroying the state. The constant feeding of the army with invasions of other countries must end, because there is simply no one to invade. Mafaruz is a tough woman. She must have gotten under Kosem's skin, because she actually erased her. It is not true that Mafaruz was dead when her son took the power. She lived until the accession of Osman II to the throne, and his problems began with her death, so she must have aroused great respect. The height of indecency is Kosem's letter to Osman, in which he asks to be called his mother, written after the coronation, in which admonishes the sultan on how to rule the country. She lost these rights by ceasing to be Ahmed's woman, and Mafaruz is now the one to admonish her. She will create her son a sultan and make her regent for two years until her children grow up. She is very naive at this point if she thinks that Haile May will give up power willingly. She certainly expected that Mustafa would be overthrown with a civil war, or that he would lose the throne due to his disability. She believed that Mustafa would not live long. By bribing those responsible for the enthronement, she also defended the fact that her sons were too young and needed protection, but their father was not much older. At that time, Kosem even claims that Mustafa is a saint, because his actions prove his holiness. Such extreme opinions that change with the exile to Eski Sarai, i.e. the palace for distant women of the predecessors. In a sense, this statement about sanctity can bring us closer to the figure of the mysterious sultan. At that time, epilepsy was considered a disease of saints all over the world. We know that Suleiman the Magnificent had this disease. Perhaps the boy was epileptic. This could be the main reason why Safiye made such a decision even if she was waiting for Yahya to arrive. A diseased arm does not make a man incapable of ruling, but if epileptic attacks were frequent, it is worse in those days. It was catatonic epilepsy, not eclampsia. However, we conclude this on the basis of very poor texts. This does not change the fact that in the first paintings the Sulin is clearly depicted with a lame hand. Even though Haile May becomes Vaili Day, Kosem retains the title of Haseki and even her salary. Thanks to the bribe, Hassan Pasha becomes vizier. The first eunuch in history, since time of Byzantium. Mustafa becomes ruler in one day. Everything happens to fast. 
It's all thanks to Cosem's bribes, but also Haile Mays. However, parties are beginning to form. As always happens in such situations, some people like the new ruler, others don't. Especially if they decided to choose him for money. Certainly, Mustafa also won someone's sincere sympathy, as much as it is sincere in politics. I have sad news for fans of the series. Although Kosem dresses in black, especially when foreign delegations arrive, she has never allowed herself to mourn. There's no time for it. This is propaganda. Mustafa certainly would not have taken the throne if Halil Pasha, the Grand Vizier, had been present in the country, but he was not there, which Kosem used. The ruler is generous and behaves very well. There are probably no people who would disagree with Professor Analchik, who states that this event is another act of the fall of the authority of the government, and the principle of seniority raises further complications. The boy spent 14 years in prison. He is 23 or 25 years old, some says that even 33, but it's probably about second coronation. Initially, Mustafa is accused of loving horse riding, walking and boating on the Bosphorus. Is it any wonder that after 14 years of confinement, a person wants to live like a simply human? I don't think so. It's hard to believe that he feeds colorful carps with gold, but if you look at the Asian courts from which the fish came, this tradition will no longer be surprising. Ibrahim will throw pearls into the pond and force his cadence to bring them back to him in their teeth. This is not surprising to Kosem. The scene of feeding the fish was supposed to take place when Mustafa was talking to Osman and telling him about how the court functions. Maybe he just wanted to show that they come to you like fish when you feed them. Money is a metaphor here. Court is feeding by money. Mustafa's generosity is intended to disturb the court, which is concerned about the treasury. This is a joke indeed. This court exists only thanks to generosity. Kosem's generosity no longer bothers anyone. The ambassador of Dubrovnik notes that the new ruler is incapable of his duties because he has no time to receive him, but he does not say anything about him being a madman. Maybe he really has not time to meet the ambassador, at last it seems that no one longer want Venetian. It all comes from the joy of freedom. The court is outraged that the ruler picks his nose, but there was no one to teach the ruler not to do it. What is also terrifying is that the ruler is visiting the city. Somehow earlier, rulers went to the city incognito, if only to find out what was troubling their subjects, and no one was bothered by it. Suleiman was a frequent guest at the market, and no one was surprised by this. Only Ahmed locked himself in a palace and lived in a mirage. In the case of Mustafa, everything is taken for granted. The Venetian ambassador calls him an imbecile, but the sultan could finally oppose the Venetians, who had been treated too leniently since the time of Safiye. Many has enough of Italian and their privileges. Mustafa certainly has a problem. Unlike his predecessors, he was not prepared for power. The fact that Mustafa was depressed should not surprise anyone, after what he went through. He certainly did not believe that he was truly free, and even more so that he had power. Perhaps this was the source of his mania for visiting cemeteries and mausoleums, which he forced his courtiers to do while conducting philosophical discussions about the nothingness of life. The man had years to think about the meaning of existence, and from his comment after receiving the gift from his brother, we can safely conclude that he understood that a good life is possible only after death. One should not be offended by the accusation that he likes theater. As you can see, Kosem begins to pick on everything to undermine Mustafa's authority. She adores all kinds of performances. The court begins to warn Haile May to get rid of Mustafa Aga, because he is planning a palace coup with Kosem, but she believes in the eunuch's explanation. Mustafa Aga is always on his side, and the more someone pays him for expressing his views, the better, and he begins to remind about Mafaruz. Finally, there is an accusation that Mustafa hates women because he does not allow them to get close to him. All historians agree that this is Kosem's invention. Certainly Mustafa has no experience with women, but we do know that he has had two cadens. Perhaps these were women given to him by his brother. He will also show tendencies towards BDSM, which may have been influenced by his life. He does not keep a huge harem like Ahmed or Mehmed. One of them was called Jensenahan Hatun, the other was a Georgian woman, Zamane Hatun, or Nihan Hatun. He had a daughter with the first woman, and the second gave him a daughter and a son. 
It is not known what happened to the prince after his father resigned from the throne, because the women and his mother lived in the old palace. If there was any son, he was disposed of immediately. Venetian ambassador Pietro Foscanini, 1640. The wife of the deceased sultan now lives in the old palace. We heard that he had two daughters, but they are not married, which we believe was influenced by the Greek Vilide, i.e. Cosem. Giovanni Capello, 1652, the wife of the late Sultan Mustafa, died last year. His daughters never married and live in the old palace. He doesn't mention anything about his son. Therefore we are not sure if it existed. The ambassador has some wrong news. The daughters will be removed. Kosem carefully erased information about them. There are interruptions in the casual information of the Italians and Moldova. They were a threat. Proof that he was able to father a child after all, and therefore he was not as crazy as they tried to portray him. Someone could always make this accusation, or worse, want to take the dynasty away from this line. They all have to disappear. The first time he was deprived of power by Mustafa Aga, probably together with Mafaruz in favor of Osman II. While Kosem may initially have some influence on Mustafa during her first reign, Haile May quickly changes sides and proves that she can be a Vili Day sultan herself. Three fronts are forming in the country. Allies of Mustafa, Kosem, Mafaruz and Osman II. The Jalali Rebellion again. The rebellion was certainly sponsored by one of the enemy factions. If you can't overthrow the ruler with gossip, you might be able to overthrow him with a rebellion, but strangely enough the people support Mustafa, and initially so do the Alema. Rebels ravage Anatolia for the money of courtiers and eunuchs. The naive Mustafa confides in one of his women that if the opportunity arises, he will eliminate the political eunuchs. A wise decision for a mad ruler. Really it was wise decision, should be done long time ago. However, Caden betrays her lover and the eunuchs rebel. Osman quickly becomes uncomfortable, but as long as Mafaruz is alive, there is little that can be done. He wants to return to the old rules and realizes foe what genichary are used for. It is no longer an army to defend the country or conquer, but to overthrow rulers. The first thing he does is restore marriages with women from noble families. He is the second sultan in history after Suleiman to marry, but the first since Fati to marry a noble Turkish woman. According to legend, the weddings were stopped after Timur Lenk ordered Bayezid's wife to wait on him and even raped her while staying in the first golden cage in history. Timur certainly didn't rape the woman. This is an exaggeration and is completely against the law of Yasa, for then a woman could not be with any man. This is not possible with all the laws governing Islam and the steppe. It's not allowed to take women whose belong to another man. This is, of course, propaganda nonsense. Let us not forget that when alone with the ruler, women as well served to their partners. There was no odalisk during erotic encounters with the sultan. Interestingly, these are records of European chroniclers and do not appear in Ottoman books. Weddings with women from powerful families were stopped only because, firstly, there was no longer a state with equal status in the area, and relationships with Shiites were out of the question. The Odalisk is a woman who will never meet the Sultan because she is a servant in the harem. But this word passed into other languages as a term for the ruler's women. Not an Odalisk, is just a cleaning lady. She is not prepared to be the Sultan's woman and will not be one. Secondly, powerful families began to influence politics too much, which led to corruption in the provinces. Interestingly, this ban did not apply to Ottoman princesses. They always married men from powerful families. The wife of Osman II Akil lived in the palace, but not in the harem, which was considered a dishonor for a woman of noble birth. She was related to Osman. The harem included only the favorite Aisha Sultan, as well as Mesha known as Meleksima, who would give birth to the ruler's son Amir. She is depicted in the series and perhaps, indeed, the war for the affections of the slave girl who he saved from the slave market led to Mehmed's death. Osman has another son, Mustafa, and a daughter, Zainab. Osman too also wants to abolish the mercenary army and create national battalions. Somehow this news reaches the genichary, no doubt through Kosem's spies. Kosem needs genichary like no other. The Sultan wants the law of Constantinople restored. 
Contrary to the tradition of the series, he did not give the order to kill Kosem's sons, but his biological brother, who was already being drawn into the rebellion. It was before Hakim. Curses and all kinds of complaints start to appear again. Osman too is even to blame for the snow falling. Mafaruz dies in 1620 and in fact Kosem's propaganda begins at that moment, when the new ruler no longer has any protection. She died two years after Safai's death. Osman condemned his teacher for Mustafa's accession to the throne. This is an interesting event, because it will explain how corrupt the court was at that time. While during Mustafa's first reign, Kosem was still reluctant to create unrealistic, stupid accusations just to seize power, now she could truly be the author of Frankenstein. Her fantasy reaches its limits. Hers and those who write on her behalf. Osman ascended the throne when the first world-scale war in history, i.e. 30 years, broke out. He will be forced to give the Battle of Hakim, as well as Sisora, to rulers such as Sigismund III Vesa and Istvan Batori. While the propaganda of both countries presented the battles completely differently, as each claimed to have won, it revealed for the first time the weakness of the Yenissary. Today it is believed that while Hakim was probably inconclusive, Sisora was the first defeat of the Yenissary. Iskander was in command at that time. There is also a Scottish thread here, because Yakub and Stuart are the peace negotiator after Hakim. Scots arrive at the court of Osman II. It could be a good film script. Kosem will make perfect use of it. The Yenissary may indeed have been outraged by the loss, but they also have themselves to blame. They have been involved in politics rather than fighting outside their country for some time now. In addition, the Polish king announced that the ruler was asking for peace in the international arena. The series really confused this thread, because it combined the character of Iskander and Prince Yahya Montenegro, who set off to Constantinople with the help of France, especially Cardinal Richelieu, pretending to be Safai's son. Tying Cossack prisoners to pile does not prove Osman's cruelty. The Cossacks would have done the same. This is what was done to prisoners back then. Osman returns as a ruler to the battlefield. He is the penultimate ruler who will take up arms. After the death of the Hodkowicz, Sobieski became the commander. This is the beginning of his career. It is doubtful that the Yenissary would be able to one with him. Whip against the Turks, although Eugene de Savoy was the whip for much longer and had to finish this game, because the Polish king returned to the country, but the war continued. That's his era of Mehmed IV who as well will disappear after meeting with Sobieski. Osman II's biggest dream is to travel to Mecca, which, surprisingly, Mustafa warns him about. It was worth listening to own uncle, because he knows what it's like to be overthrown. Such advice clearly contradicts Mustafa's bad reasoning. This is a trick, because in reality Osman wants to gather the rebellious F.A. and farmer fight with them, against Yenissary. But theory is need, however, some theory needs to be added to the conspiracy. As they say, it's best when one person knows about the conspiracy. Too many people know here. Confidant Omar Effendi, especially should not know. A teacher who is by no means on the side of his student. It's amazing why it came back into favor. Since he already cheated once. This dream arose from a dream in which the ruler saw a prophet who shot him and knocked him to the ground. In his next nightmare, Osman saw himself riding a camel, but he could not ride it, and just before waking up, he saw the animal's severed head in his hands. Desperate, Osman goes to Mustafa, who is considered as a saint. It is advised to do so by the Ulam. Mustafa could have visions during epileptic attacks. In this situation, however, Mustafa did not have to be a visionary. Locked away from people, he receives food through a small opening, but there is always a friendly guard who can give him a letter with food or inform him about what is happening in the country. It's even funny that all the sultans visited their uncle and consulted him on certain matters, even though everyone wanted him dead. The predecessor allegedly replied that it was a prophecy of the fall of the empire, and the loss of the camel meant dethronement. Mustafa predicted that his nephew would die within a few months. He wasn't wrong. However, he did not have to be a saint or a madman for this. It was enough that he had knowledge about the rumors circulating outside. It was predictable that the Yenissary would get over anything for bribes, but not losing the first battle in history and the desire to erase them from history.
The fact is that the Yenisari are very resistant to learning technical innovations, and therefore they are starting to be an outdated formation compared to the beginning of the arms race that is the Thirty Year War. And as Mustafa predicted at the moment of his dethronement, they burst into the palace shouting, We want Mustafa Khan. The overthrow of Osman was the bloodiest and most disgusting overthrow of a ruler in history. The young sultan is carried through the city on a donkey. His clothes are torn off, he is thrown with dung, his bones are crushed so that he cannot move. Even though the ruler tries to defend himself, his testicles are crushed to stop him, and then he is raped and quartered. We probably will never know to what extent the uprising was sponsored by Haile May and how much by Kosem. David Pasha orders the ruler's finger and ear to be cut off to show them as proof of Haile May's death, but did the evidence go only to Haile May or was it Kosem's propaganda? At that time, David Pasha is a person who knows perfectly well how to act on two fronts, although he is associated with Shah. All we really know is that he asked for proof of death. It doesn't make him guilty. The fact is that at the moment it is Osman who wants to kill Mustafa. This would be Haile May's decision. She won't leave him alive, because if he stays in the Kafish he will take revenge. However, Haile May did not start this rebellion. She didn't pay bribes, that did Kosem. The most likely picture of events is that she also planned to take the throne, just like Gulbahar, but it was Haile May who made perfect use of the situation. Besides, Mustafa is already a mature man. The others mean regencies. At some stage without Kosem it would not have been possible to bring about the downfall of Osman, because she managed to take a lot from the treasury. Perhaps we will have to wait a while to find out the complete truth about this day. Kosem did everything to present Haile May in a bad light, although David could participate in the brutal murder. It is possible that he acted for his own reasons. After all, his son is planned to succeed Mustafa. However, it is believed that Kosem was behind everything, because she gives bribes to anyone she can, bribes officials and looks for money, but she forgot about her brother-in-law, whose mother finally understood how to rule and took advantage of the situation. We can read from the sources. When the soldiers got through the hole in the ceiling, they saw an old wicker mat and an old pillow placed on it in a dark corner. On this cushion, facing to Mecca, sits His Majesty Sultan Mustafa and recites the Quran. The Venetian ambassador presented it differently. After making a hole in the roof, the sultan was seen half naked, because it was very warm, and because of the revolt, the Yenissary had forgotten about him, he was hungry and thirsty, because he had not eaten for several days. The only thing he asked for was water. Kosem could have taken advantage of the situation and tried to get rid of her brother-in-law by starvation. She had no access to the palace. She had to lure Osman out of it. The ruler was pulled out of his cell thanks to a lowered rope. He is so weak that he cannot stay in the saddle. At the same time, the vizier of Osman II is arrested. Mustafa clearly does not want this power. His becoming sultan is a tragicomedy. Brought by the genichary to the ulema, who still regard Osman as a ruler, he does not ask for a coronation kinja, but the genichary do it for him. When the ulema refuse, swords are put to their heads. Mustafa and two cadens are placed in the back of the carriage. People can't see them, but Haile May can be seen in front, making promises on her son's behalf and handing out gifts. The city turns into a bloodbath. There are pieces of bodies hanging everywhere, intended as warnings. They are supporters of Osman too. It is therefore not surprising that Mustafa experienced such a drastic nervous breakdown that he would call upon Osman II to die and beg him to take him to himself. Of all his brother's children, Mustafa certainly knew Osman the best. When his life was spared, he spent some time in the prince's wing with his mother, and therefore with his nephew. Maybe he was even entertaining the boy. Osman visited him, even for fortune-telling or strategic games. They both love chestnuts. He might have had feelings for that boy. Osman was the only man with whom he had a chance to go out into the palace courtyard. They both play chess. They talk about maps. This is one man who seems kind to him, at least in his youth. Then politics crept in. Mustafa did not wish ill upon Osman. If anyone of his family, it is his sister or mother. Only a British commentator suggests that Mustafa does not want to give power to his nephew. 
The problem is that such a meeting could not have taken place if we start to analyze the time and place where both men were. Kosem's sons are growing up and she is ready to fight for the throne. According to Kara David Pasha, Mustafa's brother-in-law rebelled, which may have been true, but he didn't do it without Kosem's money. We know that he asked for a proof. Indeed, some Yeniseris protect Mustafa and proclaim him ruler. However, the matter is not that simple, because in reality the Yenisari are divided. This is a civil war between Haile May and Kosem. Shah Sultan at this time gives birth to her son Suleiman. This time Haile May also wants to abolish the new system and leave one ruler alive. Mustafa's power is weaker than before, because Dervish Aga, the Yenisari commander operating on two fronts, does not resign from his position on Mustafa's orders, because why would he do that when Kosem can pay more? In this game, most of the Yenisari are clearly on Mustafa's side, but Kosem has the Agas and the Alema. Does it matter? Yes, because they are the ones who approve all the Sultan's legal acts, so all Mustafa's orders are torpedoed from above. Gulbahar, who is the mother of Prince Bayezid, must also have played some role in this whole mess. Even before the coronation, letters written by the Kaden Sanavbar appear, she is a Persian spy working with Sinan Pasha and Gulbahar. Could it be that the one Kosem will boil alive will also discover that she can be the ruler of the world? Everyone probably took part in the overthrow of Osman, except Mustafa, who was locked in the cafes and may have heard the rumors. He cannot meet his family at that time. It is controversial whether he had a Kaden or only a Gedekli. Rejected and overconfident women reached for power. Each of them will end badly. Kosem definitely no longer likes the role of the second woman, and even more so, life in Eski Sarai begins to support the bard Mir Hussein Pasha. He is a careerist, but he has one task. To invoke the injustice of the death of Osman II and the death of the culprits. Of course, not the real culprit, Kosem, who was the first to start inciting and paying off the army, and then something got out of control as usual. Anarchy is spreading in the capital, the army is robbing residents and breaking into shops, but no one cares. All the better to blame Mustafa for his incompetence. Inflation is rampant through bribery for money from the budget. The governor of Erzurum, Abaza Mehmed Pasha, took control of a huge part of Anatolia and secured his support by railing against the capital's dervishma. He was paid by Kosem. This is the official beginning of a civil war in which only own ambition counts. And I will ask you a simple question about thinking. Do you think that you will be able to create such a huge empire as Genghis Khan or Porta, only using people kidnapped and sold to your country, or you must get people another way and propose them something that will make them to gone with you? Of course, this cannot be done only with slaves. We are talking about huge armies. All people from other countries were not resettled to this warrant. The army based solely on this was neither had the Didi city, nor did it exist during the reign of Bayezid Yildirim. Yenisari turned into something completely different, just like Yasser, to which many gave their children. In the art of war, there is a two types of armies, mercenaries, because they are not the inhabitants of the country and are fighting for some reason, and national. These people received something in return and ruler had to pay them for fight, but about Yenisessary and Yasser in the next episode. Blunt summed up the situation perfectly, stating that the Yenichary had already realized that the ruler could be their puppet, and they could be the ruler. Blunt notes with concern that this will not change and the powerful Ottoman dynasty has now collapsed. In her bloody reign and thirst for power, Kosem truly ruined the state. It will take a few more years for her to experience what she did to others. Osman's death was condemned by all the royal houses in the world. It is therefore not surprising that Kosem wanted to blame this act on others who also had a hand in it. Courts of quality do not want to be deceived, and in the West there will even be several forgotten plays about the death of Osman too. The Alema are worried about the ruler's condition, which they emphasize in a letter to Haile May. Haile May does not hide the truth. Even if, out of motherly love, she believes that her son will recover. If Mustafa was ever healthy, and everything indicates that he was at the beginning of his life and in the beginning of his reign, he is not now. The events took their toll on him. The first delegation received by the new ruler is the delegation from Poland. 
At the same time, untold stories about Mustafa killing his nephew are being spread around the world. It's definitely Kosem's work. Sultan Mustafa would have to be able to walk through walls and travel on at least a magic carpet to take part in something that was happening on the other side of the city, which was huge for those times. However, the Yenissary demand payment for their rebellion, and the treasury is empty. Kosem can use that. The fact that Kosem was behind the rebellion is proven by the fact that she, not Haile May, was looking for money for the army. The Kosem court is slowly being established. She spreads propaganda about the murderous Sultan Mustafa and sponsors a rebellion that turns into a civil war. The people are against the Yenichari, accusing them of the death of their predecessor, and the Yenichari are accusing the people of throwing a shit-covered lettuce at the ruler, instigated by the army. Kosem hires instigators who will operate over time in all parts of the world, to this day. During this time, Mustafa mainly prays, begging for his nephew's resurrection. Sultan refuses to take the throne, and this is astonishing to everyone. During ceremonies and when receiving petitions, he stands next to the throne. The real master of the situation is David Pasha, but this strange man would prove useful in times less refined in cruelty, but not now when you really can't trust anyone. The army flows into the city from other regions, brought through Kosem. In fact, Mustafa is starting to come under siege in the capital. The goal is to achieve what you failed to achieve twice. More and more bays and Sanjak bays join in. It seems that Kosem again did not foresee the consequences of her actions, for which she would have to pay later. To calm the situation in the capital, David Pasha resigns. He will be strangled shortly thereafter in the same place where Osman II was insulted, raped and cut alive. After all, the people need to punish someone responsible for Osman's death. However, it is not known who ordered his death. Maybe the military themselves. Haile May chooses a very bad ally. Mir Hussein is cruel. He's a bloody soldier. Nightmare of Yenissary, and he will do everything in that way, but in this situation it's a poor tactic. Especially since the Yenissary change their fronts depending on who pays more. Attempts to fill command positions with their own people backfire on them. When they try to obtain funds from the Alema, the Yenichari demand that this man be replaced by Kamankesh Ali Pasha. Contrary to the series, he was by no means on Kosem's side, after all, Kara Mustafa's brother put his head under the axe. However, Haile May has no money to pay. Somehow, the money is in Kosem's hands. At some point, the richest woman in history had to become the richest. By changing the state budget to its own needs. It probably started during Ahmed's lifetime. However, no vizier is able to end the conflict, and Kosem do everything to win maximum support of the Alema. As Ro sums up the situation, there is not much a choice, it has to be made between the current ruler and the child. They're power hungry, hiding ambition's mother's fight to take over the state. They bribe various supporters, do it to the detriment of the state treasury, and create corrupt factions of the people. When both of them exhaust the resources of the treasury, the worst will come. The Alema are in Kosem's pocket and declare Mustafa a madman. It's worth remembering about it. People paid by Kosem issue a fatwa. Abdication is therefore the will of Allah. This is equivalent to the curse given by the popes during the investiture dispute, because it is the equivalent of the investiture dispute. Anyone can kill Mustafa. It is officially announced that Mustafa insulted religion, but it was never stated in what case, because nothing like that happened. If during his second reign Mustafa truly believed that his skin was on fire. This is a sign of only one disease, Cotard syndrome. There is no salvation for such a person. It is such a severe depression that it cannot be cured and the person becomes dangerous to everyone. Suddenly Murad emerges. The 9th of October 1623 Mustafa is overthrown and Murad ascends the throne. Murad shows certain diseases from the beginning, as Ro nicely puts it. But somehow these diseases don't bother anyone now. Mustafa is now under close guard. Only Kosem can talk to him. When Kosem becomes regent, information about her marriage to Ahmed begins to appear in letters to rulers from Europe. In Europe, it is impossible for the descendant of someone who could be compared to a mistress to ascend the throne. However, this news does not appear in the letters to the East. Everything for power. 
At that time, Selim and Orhan were still alive. The ambassadors note the fact that the Sultan is locked up in the Seraglio for wrongs, but in fact the Western world laughs at it. Everyone knows that Mustafa is the last one who could do any harm. Row lists how often officials have changed in the 15 months since Sultan Osman's death. We have three sultans, seven viziers, three admirals, five AGS of prisoners of war, six governorates only in Egypt, three ministers of treasury. I don't have the energy to write down the others, he adds. The first rebellion occurs in 1633, and the Yenissary chose Suleiman, Murad's brother. He will soon disappear, will the state become disgusted during his reign? These are propaganda moves. This tyrant, like Stalin, must be praised. Murad will certainly fill Yenissary bags with a trip to Baghdad, but he inherited the worst traits from his parents. He is cruel, he does not care about anyone, he has no problem with killing without a reason if someone questions his word. He maintains his power through widespread terror. At the same time, he is homosexual. His orgies will go down in history, although they will not be mentioned loud in the Muslim world for a long time, and he is an alcoholic. Kosem ultimately divides state assets among those who allowed her to come to power. During this period, she liquidates Mustafa's daughter. This is an event that makes no sense and sets a precedent in the harem. Soon she declares war on Kamankesh Pasha. Unfortunately, her son also has ambitions and want to rule on his own. It is not known what happened to Haile May. At the age of 12, Murad took the throne. In fact, the Yenisaris gave homage not to him, but to his mother, who achieved what she wanted through bribery, force and tyranny, to do anything jut to get her way becoming mockingly called Kosem. On that day, the Yenisaries twisted the traditional greeting associated with the coronation oath, addressing the woman as Sultan and the man as Shazad. Murad is just a prince, nothing more. In a few years they will have to call her Padisha. She will be the only woman with the title of Naib, leader of the nation. It was Murad who stated that he would sooner return the country to Greek rule than allow his mother to put another son on the throne. This is the moment when he must disappear. Cirrhosis of the liver will help with this. Mustafa Han spent 34 years of his life imprisoned, 48 years of his life if one prefers the theory that he was younger, or 50 years if one supports the new academic claims. It seems that the turning point for his psyche was the death of Osman II. He saw him everywhere, talked to him. Perhaps then he truly became crazy. Often visited by Murad IV, he could have incited him to take power in his hand, but Bekri Mustafa, also known as the ruler's spouse, did the most damage. Apparently, after Prince Suleiman's death, this brother does not appear in the series, like Orhan and Selim, Murad was supposed to ask his uncle what to do to survive. Dot. His uncle answered him directly. If you want to live and be sure that your children will survive, kill your mother, otherwise you will always look behind your back. Living with a she-wolf is unbearable, isn't it? Just kill this bloodthirsty scoundrel. Perhaps Murad listened. In 1639, Mustafa allegedly died of an epileptic attack. His death had nothing to do with the ship being set on fire, but the attack may have been to everyone's advantage. The most talented and mentally healthy son of Kosem, who could restore order, was Kazim, but his mother did not like him and ignored him. She finally set her son against her brother leading to their death. Even before the expedition to Baghdad, he kills Suleiman and Qasim. The Yenissary see them as a more worthy successor, and above all, a mother whose son is getting out of control. Mustafa died on January 20, 1639, when Murad was not in the capital, in the old palace, so Qasim could help. At first he was buried in the baptistry, because the mausoleums was overflowing with princes. Indeed, for a very long time it was not known where to put the sultan's body. Murad was tried to be portrayed as the most wonderful and the greatest sultan. In fact, he was the most dangerous of them all and as hypocritical as his mother. This convergence of characters must have led to a war between them. No one mentions that the Cossacks approached the capital during Murad's reign. It show the weakness of the country. Yahya and now Cossacks. The sultan rarely went to the mosque, he broke barrels of wine when he found it, murdered drunkards, but he himself drank alcohol every day. He stigmatized homosexuals, but he was not innocent in these matters. 
The enlightened ruler probably agrees to the first flight in history, only to then kill the scientist because he recognizes that this is not in line with faith. It amuses him. He goes to the city incognito to hunt people, under a pretext. The most famous is the attack on a deaf and mute man who blocked his path and did not apologize. This is quite strange, because the Shavush are this type of people. Murad should know sign language, which has been developed in this part of the world, but his mother didn't really educate him in anything other than promiscuity just to be in power. Let's not forget that opium has reigned supreme in the palace since Ahmed's time, Ahmed, like Kosem, has been high on drugs since childhood, and so have subsequent generations. If Murad killed Mustafa's children, he paid for it with divine punishment. He fathered many children, but they all died before him. Part of them at his order. The series overdrawn the characters. It cleaned some of them out and made others too negative. No wonder people started to get angry, viewership dropped. And finally the budget was cut and the parts about Ibrahim and Osman II were reduced to a few episodes, which is a pity because these were the most interesting times. It was not Osman who led the reign of terror, but Murad. He was a man like Stalin, not Osman as is possible to read. Unfortunately, people write articles for the internet not based on books, but on made-up fragments from the internet, and I have the impression that these are created just like some students' answers during a test, based on the TV series. History is written by the victors. Kosem had great agitators and propagandists. It took centuries to cleanse history of its lies, but there is still a lot ahead of us. Osman family doesn't help. A harem is a closed place. Topkapi Sarayi is a fortress. Ambassadors sent extreme information to their courts. These are the dark ages of empire and the beginning of the fall of the empire. Therefore, the knowledge we have about this time is contradictory. We know that Kosem should not be fully believed. She created history the way she wanted and it was recorded that way, although the events took a different turn. Despite everything, I still do not recommend learning about this period from the internet, because recently even on a reputable website you can read that Mustafa was the son of Handan, but Haile May is in the family tree. Khmerism exists, but it does not manifest itself this way. You can't have two mothers. Murad could climb a ladder and look through windows to see if people were drinking coffee or smoking in their own homes. However, he himself could not survive a day without coffee. In fact, it was Murad who drowned women who did not meet his expectations, not Mustafa, whose erotic life we do not know much about. When Kinja and cut her into pieces. It's a very romantic scene straight from Wuxia, with these Chuvashes standing over the princes during Haile May's reign, but rather unrealistic. Ibrahim did not initially take power, and Kamankesh Kara Mustafa Pasha became his right-hand man. The brother of the famous Kara Mustafa, contrary to the series, did not like Kosem very much. Only one daughter of Murad survived. She's name was Kaya. She played a very important role at court, and her marriage was a strong political alliance. Completely omitted from the series. Melik Pasha. is possible to read various things on the internet, but in books related to the topic there is clearly a note about Mustafa's daughter, and sometimes there is information about two daughters and a son who died quickly. Mustafa did not have schizophrenia. It is not known where this diagnosis came from. His symptoms contradict this. History has made him this way over time. Kosem turned him into a madman, which he certainly became over time, but he was not schizophrenic. Despite everything, the lame sultan is the most tragic figure in the history of the dynasty. It is said that Kosem has visited Mustafa once. He then compared her to Safiye. She was outraged and said that she was a cruel woman who turned her grandchildren against each other and devastated the country with a civil war. Mustafa was supposed to answer her, and you didn't turn your sons against you? Kosem said she was forced to do it. Mustafa was supposed to reply I think Safiye would say the same. You did everything because of your stupid ambition. How many have you killed Kosem? Well, how many? She never visited her brother-in-law again. Her opponents dared to claim that it was then that she decided about his death. Well, Oracle couldn't even lie. Once, during a feast, the wife of the British ambassador asked Vilide Kosem if she felt unhappy. Kosem looked at her for a long time, not hiding her surprise. The woman started to explain what she meant. 
She complained that Kosem had gone through Yasser and had been enslaved, and this must have been a great suffering for her. Kosem started laughing. For the first time, Topkapi echoed with Vili Day's laughter so loudly. After a while she stopped and replied to the surprised woman. That's the only thing I don't regret. Only in this system, by doing such a useless and primitive thing as giving birth to children, you can become the ruler of the entire world. This is indeed true. Giving birth to children, contrary to theories, does not require many feelings, nor is it a sublime activity. It's a biological activity that many confuse with maternal feelings, which you don't have to have. In no other system have women achieved such powerful power solely by giving birth to children. Since ancient times in the West it has been believed that women in the East are unhappy, while this is not true, many are happier than these emancipated women. It's a matter of upbringing and a completely different lifestyle and values. However, for centuries Europe has not recognized any views other than its own, which it imposes by force. Even in the era of colonialism, she did not try to understand the inhabitants of the colony. But more about this in the next episodes. Time to give the war against the greatest myths of Byzantium in Porta. The horrors of Yasir, an explanation of what Yasa is, Gynikium structures and much more. This is a famous scene. Described by many. The clash of two worlds. It shows perfectly that your way of life is not always good for others, and what shocks you may make others happy. Certainly this woman, despite her emancipation, never achieved the same position as Kosem, who allegedly did not have it. Red carpet. This is a Turkish invention reserved for rulers. The difference was that the red carpet was not walked on, and Yenisari kept it along the ruler's route if women were walking with him, so that men would not see their faces during important ceremonies. Today we walking on the red carpet, but once it was a ceremonial tool. This ring that circulates in the series belonged to Harem, she was supposed to be buried with it, but it was stole by Nurbanu from her coffin. According to legend, when Suleiman discovered that ring disappeared, he cursed everyone who wielded it. Indeed, believing this or not, Talib Y. Nisfan, all power-hungry Vili days with a ring of power, as it was latter called died painfully.